we are by far the most accurate AI detection solution in the whole world right now. Mask it and wrap the content in such a way that your personal data will be completely eliminated. When we provide it publicly available, certain groups of people start basically using it for wrong purposes. Whatever the knowledge that you are putting into it, just knows that. It's not a magical box that it knows everything. Hello everyone and welcome, welcome back to another episode of Talk to Rami show. It's an exciting day because I am sitting here with Yakub Ibrahimov. He's here. Hardcore entrepreneur, investor, technologist, and he's an immigrant. He's got a he's got a story, and we're going to talk about that. And we're going to talk about Polygraph, which is the CEO and founder of Polygraph. We're going to talk about artificial intelligence, my favorite topic. Welcome to the show, my friend. Thank you, thank you for having me here. I appreciate you. Oh, thank you for being here, man. You know, we met. I think it was the last month, a couple of weeks ago. And I really enjoyed when you talk about the AI and everything else. And well, you said something, you came here before COVID, I think, and you stuck. A week before COVID. <laughs> before COVID, yeah, you came before COVID and then you stuck and now you are living in Austin, Texas and you have Polygraph Company. Tell me a little bit about your background. You know, you're from Azerbaijan, I know that. How you end up in Austin, Texas? Uh, there's a place called, or event called South by Southwest. So yeah. I, I came here on, on the 29th of February, 2020. And very, very like fortunate. I we just got married and got uh, our son. And we were like, okay, let's, my wife has been talking about or had been talking about Lake Tahoe. And I was like, I'm going to South by to speak. Why don't we go as a family and uh, we explore a warm area? It's just one day that I'm going to be speaking. I believe it was the 8th of March that I was, 8th March, or 9th yeah. of March that I was supposed to be speaking at an event. And for the 10th of March, I, I bought the flight ticket to Reno, Nevada, so that we could go to Lake Tahoe. That was the most luckiest thing that, that happened <laughs> at that time. Uh, on the 4th, I believe, of March, they shut down the borders and they, they shut down the city. Like they kicked us out of the hotel. We moved into Airbnb and they, the Airbnb also said that on the 11th, they're moving in themselves into that house. And we were like, what are we going to do? We caught literally the last flight to out of Austin and we went to Lake Tahoe. Wow. And everything else from there on is like a history. No and you, you decided to stay. I didn't really decide to stay, you know, I have a allergy issues, uh, immune deficiency issues. Uh, and my doctor said that you shouldn't be traveling. We were on a tourist visa, no, no status, no nothing. And you know that now I know it, that if you don't have social security, you're, you're worth nothing here. <laughs> you don't have identity. So forget about no matter how much money you have, you don't have social security. You cannot rent a place. You cannot do anything. Right. Anyway, long story short, uh, while I was stuck here, I was trying to find my way around it. Um, a friend of mine in Germany spread the word that founder of seven markets group, uh, is not coming to Europe. Uh, seven markets was my previous company, yes. which, which was one of the world's top media groups for, uh, retail finance, uh, Forex, Comex, uh, cryptos, etc. And, uh, yeah, that created the weirdest exit for me, like within literally the hours, I'm not even going to say days, we had like 40, 50 different private equity firms and financial entities, et cetera, reaching out to us and asking like, would you be interested in selling the whole holding or like A to Z markets or iCoin summit or iCoin sentiment and so on and so forth. And we ended up selling the whole company by December. Uh, December the 25th was the last transaction that we did was the A to Z markets.com which got acquired by a Maltese private equity firm. Uh, and then we were like, why do we need to go back? Uh, why do we need to go back? I 
Um, I came to Houston, basically helped a friend of mine, uh, started a $100 million fund in Houston. Uh, but uh, I honestly didn't really enjoy the VC part of life. Why? Why uh, not? Because I'm, I'm an operator, you know, when you are an operator, you want to do stuff. Like it, there is something inside you that, you, what's my purpose? My purpose is not to write a check. Uh, you can write, uh, there, are, there are bankers, let them write the check, uh, the VC funds. There, there are some people really great at it, right? I'm not one of them. I am, you, you saw that, that is, is, is not you. So it wasn't me. I, I was like, and I wasn't working. I'm not saying that I was working or whatsoever. I was just helping a friend of mine uh, for him to get going, right? Uh, and just during that period, my wife uh, started her new company uh, and uh, she got an invitation to Austin by, I don't mind mentioning the name, Sputnik ATX. And she was like, can we go to Austin? <laughs> I had no clue that even she started the company at the beginning, uh, although I was investing from our own company, uh, company like for, for her activities. I was her first investor, but I had no clue that she already started as a, as a company. So we came to Austin and Sputnik invested in a growth channel, my wife's company. And, uh, she, she said, let's go move in Austin and that way we can be closer to people. And I actually liked it better. You know, Austin has much better weather compared to Houston. The people are, uh, you know, uh, Texas is an amazing place. I love it here, uh, except the allergies. Yeah, the, allergies pretty bad. Yeah, yeah. Yep. Uh, and that's basically how we brought to how we got brought to Austin, but it was still a hell of a journey. Like how long you you have been living in Austin? Uh, since November, December, pretty much of 2020. December 2020, and you see the rise of technology here, like you have seen how many startups are coming here. You went to the South by South, the, the recent one, and you've been involved, you know, I know you're very involved as an angel investor, as a tech entrepreneur, you have seen it, listened to pitches and everything else. Where you see this technology is going? And you created a polygraph that we're gonna talk about that. It's an amazing concept. And a lot of people, they don't know what they don't know. And they have to be educated. We talk about that. You know, that, that's the most important thing of, of polygraph, that to educate people. But where do you see the technology is going right now? Is it really destroying us or helping us? It, re it really depends on what you are doing, right? It, uh, I don't want to say technology is, is biased or technology helps or doesn't help. It's about who uses that technology. Right, uh, I can take a very simple, like, uh, let's say my phone, right? If I call that phone to, to, to check how my friends are doing, does it help me? The answer is yes. But if I use the exact same phone to call you and harass you, is that a bad technology then? It's about who is the operator, who is running the, who is behind the steering wheel. Now, I believe the technology you are referring to is AI that you are, you're going to be leading towards. The, the, the word in the town is all about AI. Good, bad, the ugly, doesn't matter. Everything about you open your TV, it's about AI. But the big issue about AI is that people don't understand what, what the hell it is. I had a conversation with, uh, with an elect individual uh, not from Texas, another state. And I received this weird question from him. What the hell does AI to do with computers? Seriously? For real. Like I was like, what else is it supposed to be? I'm not going to go to the details of that conversation, but it, it just means that, you know, people don't understand what they are even talking about. Unfortunately, we live in a very weird environment that most people are so much reliant on their phones and so on. They do social media and et cetera. They don't really read. They don't really do research, even like important people. And, uh, you know, self-study is the core of personal development. Self-study is the core of understanding the universe, us, yourself. And that, that goes again, going back to it, technology isn't good or bad. You need to understand 
it a little bit. And once you understand the technology, you see that ever since we have we have been introduced to technology, our lives is getting better and better. That's I, that's the I thing. I totally I agree with you. And I had the same conversation with somebody about the AI, and I said, let let me explain it to you. A knife can kill you, or a knife can make you to survive. You know, it's up how you're gonna use it. Knife can, you know, cut the watermelon, knife can, you know, stab you. How you're gonna use it? Because lots of people out there, they are believing by AI, which is, is rising, is gonna take away the jobs. But I think if you're not learning, or as you said, not understanding the good, bad, and ugly about AI, you're not gonna get a job because you don't know it. It's happening, I think it's a tool. And the polygraph, and you're gonna explain a little bit what is polygraph, because people, they think, oh, it's a polygraph. Did I lie? No, it's not that, it's not that polygraph. With an F, by the way. Yeah, it's in a, in a, <laughs> with the F, but you know, that you guys are really, I think, helping to more prevent data breach and secure the security, something like, am I right? To, to a degree, but let's actually take a step backward since I believe your audience is tech savvy, but also I'm sure there will be some people don't understand. Yes. Or haven't used absolutely. properly. What is AI, AI or large language models that people are really referring today? Essentially speaking, it's very advanced bot. It's, it's very advanced bot made out of, like the name suggests, large language. It, it, it is made out of really gigantic data set. Uh, to make it in a simpler term, AI as we see today is a data ledger and that meshes up content to create content. Like I'm just trying to make it an easier language. So as an example, we have, we are in a way ourselves a large language model, right? We know that there are zero to nine numbers and we use the, those zero to nine to generate you know, uh, 10 to 100, 100 to 1,000, 1,000 to 10,000. If we refer to that uh, large language model from that perspective, every word that is inputted onto it, the now the, you know, transformers, etc., are using it to create additional gen AI that, uh, content that we are re really referring to. Of course, there is now, you know, video, audio, image, etc., on top as well. Uh, but let's, for the time being, focus on uh, simple text, right? So what it means is that AI will be helpful for you, but it will also be hallucinating. What if do you mean by hallucinating? It's very interesting because uh, you said hallucinating, like it's just like, like it confusing. Like let's let's say it like this: I have a five-year-old uh, boy, and let's imagine that uh, I opened the cartoon and let him watch uh, a, a cartoon about that small Martian from Disney going to Mars, right? Uh, he now automatically thinks, my son, thinks that he knows how to go to Mars. Right? That becomes it, a reality. For him, it, it, for it him. is the knowledge that he has all about Mars, right? He, tomorrow, let's say I'm having a chat with him and I'm saying, hey son, uh, there's an eclipse coming here. Uh, let's wa watch. And he's going to be like, I know how to go to Mars. Why do I need to, you know, why do I need to watch? Let's yeah, go, yeah. let's go to uh, actually moon itself and watch it from there. Because his knowledge is that of that cartoon. Now let's put that to the side. AI is a very similar thing as your five-year-old kid. Whatever the knowledge mm. that you're putting into it, just knows that. It's not a magical box that it knows everything. Now, if you have thought of it like everything about the, about Texas, but you haven't really inf uh, you know added much about the uh, Austin. Austin itself, you know, even politically, is a very different landscape compared to the rest of Texas, right? So, if you ask something specifically from about Austin, if there is not enough data in there it will pretend as if it knows everything about it and tie it up to Texas and talk from the Texas perspective only. Which it is, are, is it accurate or not accurate? And that's the hallucination come. It pretends as if it is the, a reality, 
but it will not be reality. It, it just basically mash up the words and the content and information that it has and come up from that. That's in the, that's what we refer to as hallucination. It refers and, but here is another thing. A lot of the AI people will come and say that AI is biased and therefore it's not good. And my question to most of them becomes a bias for what? And they will come and say that it becomes the bias of the person or the data that it's being referred or uh, fed into, which is the reality again. Like uh, whatever, go, uh, you know, junk in, junk out, quality in, quality out too. But also there is the political, racial, gender, etc. bias that we can all talk about. If you're talking about commercial public AI that everyone utilizes, yes, then the bias in there becomes a huge, huge issue. But then they are also mixing it up not trying to create like an unbiased environment for companies, internal AI tools, large language models and so on, which is not like quite accurate overall speaking. And the, the, the main purpose for it, why I think, I, I believe I, I have a hundred percent conviction on that, that internal AI tools need to be hundred percent biased. What do you mean by internal? The, the internal AI is the environment that we build just based on our own data we give it to him or is it open to big data so it can be both actually it can be hybrid uh, structure let's say you take one of the open source ai uh, engines out there like chat uh, gpt uh, yeah chat gpt is not an open okay. source it's a it's a private company it's and uh, everyone knows about it but let's say one of the available tools out there say uh, google's latest gemini gemini yeah Right. Uh, so that's an open source uh, part of Gemini, actually. Gemini itself is not an open source. Let's say one of the, doesn't matter, any of the AI tools that you that's public, you take it and you're feeding data onto it, your own data. Right. Now imagine I am a lawyer. I'm feeding my contracts onto it. I'm feeding my, you know, the specific thing Let's say I'm a venture lawyer. Anything about uh, like safe notes I'm feeding into it, I'm feeding into like the cliffs and you name it, everything about venture investing. I want my AI to be biased towards the style that I am actually going to be utilizing. I don't want it to, to come and generate me the content from real estate law perspective. Mm. It needs to come from a bias that, that's related to my industry and in fact, actually related to the way even I, I write, right? It needs to be my extension. And when we are talking about like AI will take jobs, AI will not take jobs. If it becomes an extension of you to whatever it is that you are utilizing, then AI actually becomes a very value add. It makes your life easier. Like I'll, I'll tell you a simple thing you asked about, you mentioned about polygraph. Um, there is this... Uh, organization, I won't mention their name, they're fighting against uh, propaganda. To, to be more precise, Russian propaganda. They identify certain things on social media and so on, and they try to under, understand where it came from and try to eliminate the threat in there. Kind of puzzle that they have been fighting for the past uh, four or five months. They have a dedicated work group. They believe that it's actually a big threat. Uh, like it's it's a threat that they have identified. I, I can't disclose the okay. details. They have a big group of people working on it day in, day out for that one specific thing for three plus more weeks nonstop. Okay. Uh, and it, it actually happened that we had a chat with them today earlier in the morning. With this group, we utilize Polygraph. And we have Polygraph, uh, basically it's an AI governance and intelligence solution provider. What it means by saying intelligence, we also detect like AI generated content, tell you what created it. And what source? Uh, and what's, what's the source of uh, like inspiration for the content to that? Of course, the, deep, the deeper you get, the less accuracy becomes. Because again, large language models tend to hallucinate, right? Um, but for this specific organization, uh, today, as an example, uh, when we had the conversation, they brought that one piece of social media content to us and saying that we cannot find out, out where it is from, what it is. Uh, it, 
but it sounds like really, really scary. We are look, looking at it. It's like my very first thing, thought that came to my mind was that someone was joking with them because it was a, in a very gibberish like environment, but inside it, like your mind starts actually putting together that there is going to be some attack or whatever happening to a group of people. But in short, literally it took us 24 seconds for Polygraph to identify that 54% of that content was Mistral generated. So wow. it, uh, but the remaining 46% was humanized content. What it means is that it was actually fully generated by Mistral. And they humanized. Uh, and they humanized it. They used, we even identified that they used one of, the, uh, I won't mention the name of that. Uh, I know which uh, one it is. <laughs> uh, humanizer. So they used a humanizer tool. We even identified that for 46% what it was. Uh, we showed that, you know, it's an altered text. And it took us another 10 seconds altogether to identify that there were two source of inspiration for, uh, for the, for Mr. All to generate that content. And it was part, it was basically a scribble, uh, puzzle. It actually was not a threat. Wow. Basically, all, all you together, know, 34 the, seconds. The job, <laughs> yeah, the, that, that's amazing. And what you're telling me, basically the polygraph, what it does you know, you not only identify, is it written by AI? And then if they turn it into one of the humanizer engines, and then they turn it to be like a human written content, you can even tell that. And then another level, you say, is it really serious or not? Uh, we cannot say that is it really serious. It's the part of the, that group uh, yeah. themselves. It's just a tool, once again, like the way that I started it at the beginning, you can use it to, and you can make the decision. Like, I personally believe that AI needs to have a certain type of human friction in the middle. Uh, that's how you make sure that, you know, just in case there is a serious, like if you're using it for law enforcement, uh, the machine can have a high, you know, level of conviction that something is dangerous or not, but only human has that sixth sense in a way. How right. the polygraph is going to help the law enforcement. Uh, so we provide what it is uh, to them, like, like in that specific example. Another uh, way polygraph really, like uh, that's the core element. So essentially speaking, we have a enterprise suit that we provide to data centric organization, public or private, private, which enables you to use any AI tool, anything that you, you can think of but without ever transmitting your private or confidential information to that AI tool. So that's the part, that's the main part. We call it like privacy centric governance. So the way it works is that I mentioned confidentiality as well. Yes. Right. We are not just detecting your name in there and saying that don't do that. But, uh, but we are also detecting confidential information as polygraph is fully on-prem. It becomes your personal extension. It's living like for organization to organization, we, it varies, but you can put it on your hybrid cloud or your local network or your personal laptop. Uh, and it doesn't necessarily need GPU nor internet to actually operate. Really? So you can completely unplug yourself if you are using it just for data analysis. A polygraph will completely operate on your device uh, for intelligence organizations, etc. It comes very, very Andy, from that perspective, it understands. Therefore, it first learns what kind of person you are, what 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 kind of like data you consume, and what kind of content or data do you produce. And therefore, starts understanding what is confidential for you, what's proprietary for you. And even imagine, let's say, at Polygraph, myself, I'm the CEO, and let's say on the other side, Vignesh Karumbaya, who is my CEO. What is confidential for me is not confidential for him. For him or what's proprietary for me is not proprietary for him. Although we are working day in, day out together, right? So the, the engine starts understanding that confidentiality element as well. And now what does it mean? Understanding is one thing. So let's say you are writing an email. Yeah, for right? example. And, we do that every day. <laughs> and imagine now uh, Microsoft has this uh, Copilot, right? Copilot pops up in there saying, let me rewrite it for you. 
So you have written something there, right? Copilot will actually not have the direct access for it. If you agree for, for it, Polygraph will take the, the email that you had, will kind of mask it and wrap the content in such a way that your personal data will be completely eliminated. Your proprietary information will be rewritten in such a way that it makes sense for the copilot to write the, uh, whatever it is, but it will not know what it's actually directly about. Wow, basically uh, it's a layer of security. Correct. And once that copilot generates the result for you, Polygraph will again kick in, put in where your information was supposed to be in, and all you do is press send. And how long that's all this takes? It's real time. Wow. Wow. So that's, that's, the, that's the governance side, pri- uh, privacy-centric governance. The very same way you, you, organizations, like uh, law enforcement as an example, we have certain law, uh, government groups. We, you know, you know, have you seen any government document that's redacted, like confidential? Yes. So there, there are literally these ladies, uh, often ladies, uh, called grandma ladies. Uh, they are given documents and they are given like three, four weeks to go ahead and identify privacy, confidentiality inside and redact it. Like marker and, and you, right? On polygraph, we, we have this, you know, uh, again, like privacy governance inside. You can upload any document that you want to upload, any document, uh, and say, identify uh, all PII data, meaning personally identifying information, identify furthermore, like all the let's say URLs inside, identify all the API keys, whatever, or confidential, confidential information, passwords, etc., and redact them all. No matter the largest documents we've, we've analyzed in the past was 426 pages long. Holy moly. And man. upload to download, meaning you upload it and you download the, the redacted version. For 426 pages, we took 23 seconds. Wow. So we, and it's often more accurate than any human will do. But of course, we always ask the, the other party to double check it just in case, you know, maybe there is a handwriting that we couldn't properly identify. At the end, it's machine, right? And the same thing, or you have a document, let's say in our company, we are using a uh, certain file sharing uh, software. It's a... It's a folder that we share it between each other. And let's say I just hired an intern. I don't want my intern to go ahead and see all the names of the people in there, the contracts and so on. I want them to see what we are working on, but I want all the private identifiable information across the board to to be hidden. So at Polygraph, our file management uh, engine, when I open the same file, a contract, I see everything unmasked, like everything normal. But if an intern opens it, he will never see it. what it is the contract. Who is it about? It's the same file. And it's the polygraph, again, like privacy layer that sits on your device. This uh, is so amazing. I'm, I'm seriously, you know, I, I read about polygraph, but when you explain it, the way you explain it, especially as, as far as, you know, the, the attention to the details and the privacy and the security, I think is a great, great tool for many government agencies, even for the corporation that, you Forget know. Forget about government or corporation. It's great tool for any person that cares about his privacy. But, but we lawyers. Will not, <laughs> but we will not sell it to pers- uh, people. In Why not? Uh, we have not, I mean, we are on a mission to, to protect our future. And Does it people protect the future? Yes, it does. But at the same time, we notice that when we provide it publicly available, certain groups of people start basically using it for wrong purposes. And uh-huh. that creates more problems than benefits. And from that perspective, we do not want to give is it. Is it that happening to AI right now? It is happening and it will happen. We cannot really, like as an example, uh, our AI detection, the content detection, source detection model, um, we initially refused to sell to any universities. We We're still not- don't sell it. Because they started punishing people uh, for identifying that 
the certain universities are saying, okay, we are building the future of humanity workforce and blah, blah, blah. And then they go say, you cannot use AI to generate anything, write anything. And we were, we are currently by far, you know, we don't, we are not a consumer centric solution right now. So most people don't even know about what the hell we do. Excuse my language. No. Uh, but, uh, we are by far the most accurate AI detection solution in the whole world right now. And I say it with full confidence. Like we just did an independent uh, audit of all the AI detectors yesterday. We outperformed the closest one by 6%. We are 6% wow. more accurate than the, the closest one. Um, now with that being said, why, why didn't we want to give it to universities? We don't want them to use our uh, tool to punish students. But do you agree that, or disagree that the students should not use AI to write their papers, for example? or they should use it as a tool, as an enhancement tool, or discovery, research, whatever we call it. So AI is everywhere right now, right? It's everywhere. Like, let me give you an example. Uh, we, we have added additional detection metric on, onto our AI detection, and that's called grammar enhancement. What is that? So there are tools like Grammarly or Microsoft yeah, Grammarly. Zone and uh, tools, etc. These are you're writing it, you make a mistake, the, it keeps, it, it pops up correct. and helps you, you know, enhance or correct your mistake. That's an AI. It's not just magic in there. And we are able to detect it, by the way. Now, certain other tools out there, because they cannot detect what created it, they'll mark it as AI generated content and universities will punish those students. Like University of South Carolina, as an example, recently, expelled or punished a student. I don't exactly re re recall what was the final verdict on the, on the girl because she was using Grammarly because she was using Grammarly and she's like literally uh, swearing by it that I did not use anything. We analyze it. We see that it's Grammarly actually being used, but other tools have marked it as AI generated content. Now we are looking at it and in the, in the coming couple of weeks, we'll actually put a publicly available AI detection solution as well, that you'll be able to see whether something is AI or human. You can also see it to see how your writing analysis is like the overall like explainability. You'll, you'll able to be able to see, um, as well, if you, if this content is original or, uh, edited an original on both way. If it is pure AI content or someone wrote it on AI and tried to hide it, or is it pure human and someone used AI to, to enhance it for better. So uh, we will not give the source detection and uh, copyright detection or intelligence detection to the public, but this is coming up and we, we feel like, like as an example, how I'm using that tool myself, um, on LinkedIn, we, you have LinkedIn. We, yes. That's where we were talking, right? We, the very to, same tool basically right now shows me which one of the new connection requests is a bot or- Your or we, polygraph? Yeah, yeah, polygraph. Uh, wow, I need I that. I can show it to you afterwards. <laughs> yeah, you got to show it to me. My, my LinkedIn, because I really don't know. So I like, get a lot I'm, of All I'm doing is like highlight it and press polygraph detect and it shows me uh, whether it was human or uh, some bot. And we noticed that uh, right now, majority of the, uh, what's it called? LinkedIn bots are Llama 2 bots. Uh, pretty much all of them actually are Llama 2 bots. And I just basically go reject, reject, reject everything that's Llama 2. Uh, Can that happen with social media? Of course. It's LinkedIn a lot of people. Media, yeah, right? It's a lot of people right now. We have seen it because we do social media strategy. A lot of people, they buy bot followers. That would be amazing. Are you run the We pod? don't identify the user. We identify the content. The content. Yeah. Like you say, okay, all these followers, the content, they are bots. The, the content of it, yeah. Like you, it's very simple to utilize. You just actually press one button and select whether you want AI human or you want to do any advanced other metrics. It's, it takes... 0 0.2 seconds per 8,000 words. Uh, wow. So it's, it's real time. It's uh, immersive. It's, 
it's frictionless in a way. But you know, as AI is getting, a, I, I don't know if should I say but that or not. Can I stop you for sure, one sure, second? Sure, sure, go ahead. AI content is not bad. AI content is not bad. Last year in February, we analyzed it on a million different data points. Only 13% of it was synthetic. This year during South by Southwest around five, six weeks ago, we analyzed like another 1 million random data points. We don't select like where it came from or whatsoever, like random. 57% of it was synthetic. Synthetic meaning somewhat machine generated. So the feature involves pretty much 100% of the content, like we mentioned about Grammarly, right? Yep. Being almost everything will be synthetic, but it is very important to understand what created it. Is the source that it's coming from, is it somewhat connected to some propaganda machine? Is it coming from some deep web related source? And ba that's the Basically that what you're telling me, correct me, or if I'm wrong, the AI, imagine that we all know, this is for the people, if you guys, you don't know artificial intelligence, this is a time you got to learn. I'm learning because this whole talk to Ron Michel platform is for me to learn along with you. But basically the, this AI is a big giant data that we fit the data, we fit the data to this machine. And this machine gets the smarter and smarter by the data we give it to that, but if the data is not good, as you said, the creator is not a really good creator, it's going to be junk, isn't yeah. it? Well, it's not going to be junk. It creates uh, security issues. Per Basically, it opens lots of other challenges around it. Like, uh, right, like, I won't again mention the names of organizations. There is a bank in New York accidentally transferred 20,000 New Yorkers data to one of the AI companies without ever even being engaged with that AI company. The reason for it was he, the, 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 the bank started using this uh, analytics company that was saying AI powered analytics. They were just using an API of this AI company. You can guess which one I'm basically talking about. And there isn't anything that that AI company can really do. That data is on their database right now. Oh. Uh, and they cannot, this number one, this issue got unearthed like around four or five months later. So they will not be able to delete it. They, it, it just is not possible. Because if you get access to your data analytics with the software that is powered uh, by AI. Powered by AI basically means an, it's an API company. When something, someone says that we and are have an access. AI powered company, it means that they are an API company. They take an API from Mistral or uh, Google or uh, OpenAI, et cetera, and analyze your, they take your data, send it to the other party, analyze it or via that analysis, they, they generate the result for you. And that's where the big problem is. Like for us, that's hence the reason why we try to understand what is the source of, source of that content and what's the copyright ownership on it? Like, you can even detect uh, who wrote it as a copyright? Like copyright, just because you use, let's say, ChatGPT to, to write a book doesn't make that you are an author, right? That's the big discussions going on right now. Everybody's writing a book. So everybody is pretending that they're writing a book, but that data, that book, original copyright comes from someone else's IP, intellectual property or copyright. So at Polygraph, that's what I was saying with that, uh, you know, uh, organization that we understood the analysis of it uh, earlier today. Uh, where is it? We are actually trying to understand what's the inspiration point. What data did AI utilize to actually generate the content that you have? So now if you are detecting that, that source of inspiration is coming from malicious misinformation center. Source of inspiration is coming from, it's coming from some Russian website and, and so on. You can basically go ahead and create connected dots. Again, we don't want to provide everything. We don't want to direct anyone on any direction. We just show the proof points. People can make their decision themselves, how they use it. And by the way, we, since we are fully on-prem, we don't understand it. We don't even know what people are using us for. 
And that's also another reason why we want to understand like who is using polygraph. We want to be, we are very, very selective who we are giving our tool to. And that way, you know, uh, I know that someone is not going to use us to, to generate like completely anonymous, something that's untraceable. Because you have a qualification process for all your clients. Yep. Wow. Like they go through that process. If like, of course you ask them why you want to use polygraph. So there is a simple online forum. Like every day we'll get around 80 to 90. Uh, 82 to 90 requests? Correct. On daily basis. And I would say that 99.9% .9 of them will never hear from us. And we won't get back to them even. Uh, there are certain like requirements in there that uh, it's automatic process actually. Like if someone really, an organization really matches the the, the qualification immediately they get to be connected. We don't have salespeople in the team. Uh, so if something that's going to happen that is worth being connected, it will come to me directly. And we, we don't want to sell it to thousands of companies. We want to be very, very selective. Like when we had a conversation earlier before we yeah. started it, right? What, what did I say? Like we will not sell outside the U S. Uh, is that not gonna, this is just a thought. Is that going to hurt? your company to a scale or it's going to keep you in just. No, it, it actually makes us very stronger, right? Um, we have demand and I'm not saying that we will not be onboarding more companies. It's just, we need to understand how certain groups of people are utilizing us so that we can put a guardrail around it as well. Like, uh, uh, we need to be protective. We need to be like, we cannot just accommodate possibility of someone using us to harm someone else or someone using us as an example to detect their malicious AI content and find a way to make it undetectable. Mm. Right. Uh, everything is possible. Technology has technology uh, solution, right? It's always involving and you have to involve as well too. So we are, we are ourselves learning and doing research, uh, investing our time, resources, and everything. And in many occasions, you know, every day we learn something new. And like, here is one thing that we quickly fixed. Like, uh, we were analyzing something and it popped up that it was AI generated content. I could read it and it was like, I'm seeing AI, AI content. We have two types of analysis, visual analysis and the contextual analysis. Visual analysis was screaming that it was AI because it's an OCR and so on and so forth involved on it. It reads, or it was screaming that it was AI. Just a simple text input analysis. It was saying that it's, it's an organic content, no, no AI. And I, I really got puzzled around it. Like, what was it? And the answer was very simple actually. So this group of people were using Cyrillic alphabet, <laughs> changing basically the letter E, English E to Cyrillic E, and it looks the same to my eye, like as a human being. Uh, and for AI, it was not able to understand what it was because e, the, the code for the, those two languages are, are different. And they were also using very smartly the letter I to Turkish letter A. Eh, yeah. Right. So it was a simple thing, right? And it was not, it was passing the AI detection that uh -oh. it was not a AI and uh, we fixed it very, very fast. Like, uh, and right after it, the second, like we, we have been doing our research and development, etc. but we didn't know about that. And we didn't think about that, not know, but we didn't think about it. It's you not... need to think about it. Right. And within a couple of uh, hours, we fixed it uh, and put an update on it, patched it up. And now we have even uh, identified around hundred plus different additional similar things that, uh, people can do or could do. We have fixed those things as, as well. Like that's why we need to have people give us feedback and only afterwards we'll make a decision whether we yeah. want to give it to you went, uh, I know we talked before you went to Washington DC, you went to DC and you met some government officials. How is, what they think about polygraph? What is their feedback? Are they supporters? Next week we will announce our very first advisor. And it will 
I can even give the date. We'll announce him either Thursday night or on Friday morning next week. Uh, to, to, I don't know when this podcast will be live on the 11th or the 12th of April. Every official that I've met so far, their number one challenge is deep fake content, deep fake videos, really? images, uh, especially in this election year that we are in, uh, can stir things completely on an opposite direction. Like if, you know, President Biden's video is being popped up that he's doing something else or uh, on the other side, President Trump's video pops up something else. You can change people's mind. He, he talks like him, acts like him, seems like him or it, uh, not he. Uh, human mind is not able to comprehend. Is polygraph capable so, of detecting it? Yes and no. Yes, we have a that program would be a game on that side. No, we are not selling it yet because we, like, as I said, we like telling things that we, in such a way that we are the world's number one. I, I really enjoy saying that because it gives me confidence. But, uh, and you are. But for deep way, uh, deep fake detection currently our accuracy isn't that high. Uh, it's around 72% accurate uh, currently. We need to bring it up and we are working on it. Uh, but there is a video detection coming up, image detection and audio detection as well. And, wow. Uh, it needs to be lighter as well. Like right now it, it's too expensive. Like if you're analyzing something, it takes, it costs too much money as well. Like uh, there are lots of like further enhancements that we need to do. How many PhDs are working for you? Uh, I would fail <laughs> to answer that from the PhD perspective. I know my team has, has the first names. I don't want to know anyone's yeah. really, um, I don't care about their education. I, what do you care? I care about how crazy they are. What do you mean crazy? Data driven crazy or no, they, technology crazy? Or Reb human crazy. Rebel minded people. Like that's what I'm looking for. I, I care about someone that is so like, he, here is one thing, Rami, like if I open my email, you would be surprised to see how many people are trying to even get to polygraph to work for free. I use the word for free. Like we have MIT grads, Stanford grads, UT Austin grads. They are really? reaching out to us to work for free because they resonate with the message that we are actually passing it. Right. But we are not looking for the dollar value in there, like wh whether you come free or you pay or whatever. We are the paying, mission. but like here is one, one question that I will always ask. And I read it in one, one of the books a long time ago. Um, I, I believe it's actually from Peter Thiel's book that I read. Um, I will ask one question. You are a one or a zero in the AI world and you are in a chaotic environment, which one are you, one or zero, and why you are that? And I, there is something specific I'm looking for it, and 99% of the people will just fail with that question, and I won't basically proceed with it. Wow. Uh, but we have, like, why I don't really care much about education level is, like, we have PhDs, naturally speaking, in the in the team, but I also have a team member that is disabled, never even graduated high school. I know it as a fact because I hired him, and that person, uh, White had hacked certain cent central bank, and protected them from gigantic money loss, multiple billions of dollars of loss that they're looking got. for skills. So skills, but and also specific, specific like I in a way like orientation in a way like I'm looking for their why you know what that's it means? the key that's I'm looking key. for their why if you ask someone like everyone can make salaries uh, any software engineer can can pick any company currently there is a huge demand any AI engineer can make money in anywhere right now but where do they go that's, that's kind of like really, really important. And unfortunately, not everybody has the correct why. We, we, are, we live in a modern messed up world that most of our children wants to be a social media influencer. Unfortunately. Uh, so 
and that's having a big impact, especially young people and so on. And and I don't blame them, you know. Uh, they are the large language model. The data that goes into them is a, yeah. is a wrong type of data. And when, when you look at, let's say, China as an example today, if you interview any average school student, they all want to be scientists and astronauts and firefighters and so on. In the US, everyone wants to be. In the West, not just the US, in the West, everyone wants to be influencer. Everyone is on their social media. What is your why, Yago? Yeah, well. I'm scared. Of what? I'm scared of my, you know, as it, my whole why changed really completely when I became a dad. Are you serious? Uh, yeah. In which like, way? Responsibility, love for the son, love for the kid? You know, I don't come from a privileged background. So I've always made more money than my dad does. Uh, ever since I know myself, since I believe eight years old, I make more money than my dad does uh, or has ever made. So I, my dad always had to put the food on the table and I never really got to spend time with him. Uh, fortunately he's alive and he's meet with my family. Uh, I asked them to be with my sister than me, you know. Um, but I became a, a dad. One, I didn't want to be my dad towards my son, meaning that chasing the money and so on and and he wasn't chasing, he was chasing the, the food on the table, by the way. We barely made ends meet. I'm not, uh, like, if you come to my home, you'll see that we always, every meal that I, I need to have kind of like meat on the table. It's because when I was growing up, I could literally count my fingers how many times I had meat as as for food. Like, I'm not ashamed of it. That's who no. made it to, I been mean, what there, made me. Been there, done that. Uh, but back to you, like, I'm scared of my son like being harmed by someone. I'm scared of my son being somewhat harmed by something. I see these like school shootings and so on everywhere. Uncertainty, uncertainty happening. Those things are scaring me. And therefore my why is that I want to build a solution that can help me protect my son and also help you know, law enforcement or organizations, companies, doesn't matter, help their own people as well. Sooner or later, we will get to that level. But, um, you know, that's that's what, what my why is. If you would ask me this question, why, maybe like eight years ago, nine years ago, I would have said that I want to be a billionaire or whatsoever. But uh, that's a huge change. Like as soon as you become a father, I'm a father, as you become a father and you said, your responsibility bigger than your mansion or you begin than your cars or how much money you have in the bank because you actually giving something to the society as a result of you, what you have done as far as raising your kids, educating your kids, because you are really into education. I know. And you mentor so many entrepreneurs, you mentor people. And, you know, I think that's, that's the reason I don't think so. You're scared. You're trying to prevent at the same time. You're trying to prevent, like I'm trying to do that. Be honest with you. I'll I tell always you one, tell my one, kids. one thing, you know, like it really happened to me. Like in 2020, it was pandemic. We were all locked down and so on. We sold, we sold the company. I had the money. I went ahead and bought a, a, a boat. And I never even went on it. A few years later, uh, not even a few years later, a few months later, we ended up selling it because I couldn't bring it to, to the US. We, we had it in Europe. I, I did everything that I wanted it. But one thing, stuff is stuff. You know, things are things. It's stuff. Material. It's stuff. Like the word you say, the, it's anything that we have here. My car is just a stuff. You're not owning it. You own it, but it's just the stuff. What is the value for you? I Nothing. can go get on a, you know, a Lamborghini and I can get on a, Toyota. I don't know, Toyota Corolla. It will still get me from A to B. I agree sure, with you. I want it to be a little faster than Corolla. <laughs> but besides it, it's stuff. It was a Rolex you, watch. It shows you the same time as my watch does and you're not hey. wearing any watch, <laughs> you know? Like 
it's it's just the stuff, right? What is gonna like? I have uh, if you ask this question to my my friends, like I have few true friends, like uh, you tell them like, what is that one dream that Yagup has? Like for real, like they know it. Everyone knows it. I don't mind telling it here. Like since my son was born, I wanna I have that uh, that mission by the way, and I say. Wherever, whichever city that I die in, I want a street name named after me. And at the beginning, my friends were like, you're such a materialistic, you know, asshole in a way. Like, who? Like, how the hell I am materialistic? I really, I want it after I die. And there is a reason for it is, I just want to leave a mark on it, hopefully good, so that they don't mark it like, hey, this is the, you know, this is that guy's uh, street. I don't want to buy a street. I, uh, you know. The legacy. I, I want to leave something behind me in a way that I can say when I'm closing my eye, the final woman came, I, I can say that I actually saved one child. I actually saved one something. And that's what matters for me. That's my why in a way. Like, are we going to make money during the whole process? Of course. Yes, I'm going to make a shit ton of money. Excuse my language. I'm not a charity person. I am not a philanthropy person. I'm a full, full conscious capitalist in a way. I'm a libertarian. Uh, I'm not for charitable activities, but I also want to do good with the things that I'm doing it, not just for the sake of making money. If it was just making for um, making money, I would have never left the, the finance. You will be retired right now, but you're still here and working. Yeah. You know, I, I, you know, I told you I, I lost my dad like three months ago when I was burying my dad. And I said, was, you know, you know, I was in the grave and, you know, in the Muslim religion, how it works. And then I was thinking that is that life, you know, you, don't take anything with you, nothing, except your legacy and your name and who you were, where you went in life. And what you leave behind is what that's matter to the people, not only the family or your son, the people in the future that they're going to say, God rest his soul, man. He did all this. He prevent all of this because of this. That's all counts. Most of, you know, people don't understand that. I had a friend, he said, yeah, you want to, you know, give it a shot to my new Lambo. And I said, man, it's not for me, man. He said, are you serious? You know what it is? It's 250000 I just paid. I said, you know, I have a Toyota Highlander and I'm very happy with it. And I'm not really a fan of it. And I, I ask you one thing. You think you own it? He said, yeah, I'll pay for it. I said, prove it. Can you take it? What do you mean? I said, why? Can you take it? He said, no. I said, then you don't own it. The house you leave, you pay to leave. You pay. You're also use. wrong at the same time to certain level. You know, you know? we're all. Uh, we need the stuff too. Yeah, right? we need it. But here is why. Why I mean that you're wrong at the same time. You take something with you when you're gone. What? Memories. You you take that memories like whether it's the happy mom memory or not happy memory. Don't you leave me good memories or bad memories for the rest of the people you left behind? Yes, but again, like you take the memories. That's still taking the memory, right? If that guy, whomever it is, very is happy being inside it, he's going to take that memory. And yes, he should have that. Yeah. There's right? nothing wrong with we, we, I'm completely against judging people on what they do. Let them do whatever they want. Everyone yeah. ha- enjoys the world but it's very not differently. You, it's not what you want to do. Uh, I I'm perfectly fine living in a suburb. <laughs> uh, I have my happiness is that I have a very large backyard. I want to go out with my son and play soccer in there, and without caring that it, the ball is going to go to my neighbor's yard. Yeah, <laughs> I, that's my happy moment that I want to. That's take actually me. good. Yeah. Right, uh, and that's why I love Texas a little better than many other states. Uh, you you couldn't do it everywhere, right? So uh, back to that, you know, let people do whatever they want. We all come to go. 
There are two things that we do when we are born and die, uh, when we are about to die. We hold hand. Right? When a child is born or was uh, getting to born, like the very first thing, he always tries to grab something or she, doesn't matter. Like my son, like the very first thing that he was born and I was right there, he held my finger. Yeah. I have a picture of it even. My son did that. I, we, that's the first thing that we do. And when we are about to die, we also hold the, the, the loving person's hand. What, what does that mean? Like we hold hand, ask him for help when we are born. Like you're scared. And you hold hand when you're dying, you're asking scared. for help because you're scared. You're, I, I 100% agree with you. So that's, that's it. Well, you know, you, you know, I know you're busy, but it's my last question, you know, you talk to a lot of entrepreneurs out there, a lot of startup founders, you mentor people. What is the biggest advice for, for those kind of people? Like they're watching, like they're listening. I'm serious because these people, you know, they're looking for some light. They're looking for some magic pill or I don't know what it is. They're always asking, do you have any advice for me? I just don't started. be an entrepreneur. <laughs> <laughs> I love that. But if they decided to be entrepreneur, you know, what, what, what do you think? I, I know that's very scary lifestyle. It's not sunshine and rainbows all the time. It's something can be a nasty and mean environment, but you know, you got to love what you do. What, what is your feedback on that? You're a hardcore entrepreneur. Uh, and I know that. I have, I have a guy here in Austin. His name is Frank. That uh, I I don't know why I like him very much. And I can I won't uh, advertise him or anything here. Uh, so yesterday I sent him a text message saying that hey Frank I'm going to Vegas for Google Next. Um, I think you should be there too because he 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 is kind of like new to be an entrepreneur. He's also minority in a way, like, uh, he hasn't been there really. Uh, and he's also a recent dad as well on himself, uh, on his side. So he, a few hours later, he, he texts me back. He's like, man, I'm also going to Stanford, uh, for my company. Uh, I don't know if I can do it. It's too much of staying away of the family and so on. I'm like, so? Are you not committed? So what, why, what do I mean by saying that or by giving this example is that my biggest um, advice to anyone that is in my personal, like anyone that hears my voice in a way is... Don't do it, but if you are doing it, be freakishly com like committed to it. Go all the way. Uh, you are either in or you're not in. Like if you're gonna, if you think that it's all rainbows out there, pff, good luck. Uh, that's why 99% fail. Like I failed it myself. I uh, failed many times. <laughs> uh, no one can say that I haven't. It's not about like, uh, and there is an analogy that I do, by the way, with most of these people. Uh, to one of our first ever meetings, I bring a basketball. I'm like, can you make this ball gravitate? And they're like, this guy is a gun already. Like, what do you mean that make this ball gravitate? I'm like, make this ball gravitate. It needs to be up in the air. And some people like trying to hold it in their hand and so on, like, like no, make it gravitate. It needs to stay up there. And people don't understand what it is. I'm like, you are that ball. You will not gravitate until you hit the bottom. Like a basketball will need to touch the floor to rise up. You will not rise up if you don't fail. I love that analogy. Right? So you are that ball, gravitate. I'm going to use it. But you know, I'm drop it that. on the floor so that it can gravitate up. Now, for Frank... It didn't even take 10 minutes after the conversation. It's like, I talked to my boss, boss meaning the wife. I want to, I want to go, uh, but I don't have a ticket. I'm like, don't worry. I got your ticket. That's why I was actually. So what does that mean? This, the third thing, don't be afraid to ask, ask for help. 
That's right? a big thing. As long as you are committed and you are able to show the commitment to anyone around you, and they know that what you're working for, people are more than happy to help. Just ask. Ask. But if you don't ask, no one knows about it. No one knows about it. You, you absolutely know. And it. the fourth thing, there are lots of people asking for many things that they don't deserve. The fourth thing, show gratitude. Show gratitude. It doesn't take, you don't need to pay money to say thank you. Just say thank you. And that's why I love Frank, by the way. I haven't done anything for him, but he's a very thankful person. He's a very committed uh, and doing everything by heart. And I, I hoped and I pray that he will actually get it to the other side and good things will come to you. Uh, of course, there is the fifth element which you cannot control, which is luck. And no matter, you know, there are so many awesome projects, companies, founders failing it just because they were in either in the wrong place, wrong time or uh, associated with wrong place. And it's all luck. You cannot control it. It, it happens to you. So hope that you, you're lucky as well. And that's the final point, hope. Hope, I love that, hope. We all get up in the morning for hope. Hope of having another day on this planet. This is what, and every day that I'm here, I'm grateful. I'm grateful to have friends like you. We just became Thank friends you. and be there for each other. I don't know, you know. You never know when we need each other or just have a conversation. That's all about the friendship is that. But thank you so much for being here, man. I really appreciate it. If anybody wants to find you, just go to LinkedIn. <laughs> I'll put all this information below this video. And then uh, you guys, you have any question, you can, you know, message him. And I'm sure he has time. He will respond to you. And let's do something else, actually. I, sure. uh, we haven't done it yet. But I'll give you 100 coupons for Polygraph AI detection, completely free one month. Wow. Uh, and, and you can basically run whatever the type of competition that you would like and you, you give it to people. Absolutely. You guys, you heard that. We're going to do that. We're going to do that. And you're going to enjoy Polygraph because it's an amazing company, man. And it's going to change the world. I promise you, because I have that feeling. And you're going to change the world and you're going to help so many people prevent and secure, man. That's, that's the whole key for the next generation to come. So as part of my gratitude, thank you. <laughs> and thank you everyone for listening us, right? <laughs> yeah, I appreciate thank, you all. Thank you so much, man.